joining us on the show, um, and thank you for your, giving us your time, is Professor Michael Baker. Uh, welcome to the show, Michael. How are you this morning? Yeah, I'm all right, Michael. Yeah, I'm good. Um, are you Auckland or Wellington? Oh, based in Wellington. Oh, it is, yeah. University of Otago has these three clinical schools, obviously in Dunedin, but also in Christchurch and Wellington. Yes, one of your old boys is in a bit of trouble at the moment, I see. One of our ex... I'm see, I'm an alma mater of Otago as well, but you've probably seen that, this, uh, Sam Affendell, commerce student. It was always... Did you go to Otago yeah. University? No, I actually went for Auckland, uh, but I've been sort of migrating south ever since. <laughs> well, you've, you've got as far as Wellington. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes, I don't know if we, we're quite down the south, we quite regard as migration enough, Michael. Um, listen, we've, just, right. <laughs> we've just interviewed... Um, Sue Gray from the Freedom and Outdoor Party, she was obviously one of the leading lights of the anti-mandate protest. Um, but she does make this point, and I was, it'd be interesting to get your take on it, how basically uh, Britain has gone back to, well, sort of normal. How far away are we from that, do you think? Well, there are a number of factors there, and I think the two big ones are what is the virus doing? And what is our tolerance for harm at a population level? Uh, so if we think what the virus is doing, uh, New Zealand's at a different stage from, um, fortunately, from most of the world because we kept the virus out for almost two years while we were vaccinating everyone. So that's given us far better outcomes throughout the pandemic. I think most New Zealanders probably recognise that. But now, of course, we are having to cope with widespread infection and obviously this year it's, it's a big change for us. And we are now seeing a different pattern from the UK and Europe. And this is the pattern in Australia and New Zealand and some of the other countries that successfully kept the virus out. We are now having these very intense waves of infection where we may have infected half the population this year. And even though we're highly vaccinated, the problem is so many people are now getting infected that even though the risk of death has dropped by more than tenfold because of vaccination, there are so many people getting infected, we're seeing all these consequences. So that's the virus side. And then the other side is what, what level of, of um, uh, you'd have to say, death and hospitalisation and long-term consequences are we going to accept with this virus? Because this is, a, this is something that, as a society, we have to decide. Yes, well, we've never. I don't think we've had that debate, though. I mean, the irony of it is that New Zealanders don't have a say in that last bit. There's never been a sort of white paper or consultation or referendum or anything on that, Mike. Which I guess is one of the frustrations that ordinary folk have, do you think? Yeah, uh, look, I think the, um, like most countries, we don't have a very well-defined strategy. Uh, and that debate hasn't happened, I don't think. Uh, it's a very complex debate. And... As you will have heard, there'll be uh, the entire population will be somewhere on a spectrum from um, really not wanting to tolerate um, having, uh, you know, maybe um, 30 people a day dying from this infection at its peak. Um, and others will say, oh, no, that's the price you pay for freedom. So um, it is, um, you know, a great, a really important discussion. And one of the, the difference between infections is that the decisions that individuals make affects everyone else and I always think it's like the road rules if you want to share a road together um, you can't say to everyone oh it's your choice about which rules you you choose to um, accept you say actually we want everyone to meet at least a minimum level of good behavior on the roads good driving behavior because if you drive erratically or drive drunk that poses a risk to you but also to the other road route users and that's the difference it's the difference between if you go into a restaurant and choose um, uh, to uh, have, um, you know, um, perhaps very unhealthy food, that's your choice. It's not a, no one else will care particularly. But if you go into a restaurant and you are highly infectious with um, COVID-19, it's not just your, your health that you're um, affecting, you're affecting the health of people around you. Just like someone lighting up a cigarette in a restaurant, we'd say, actually, that's not good for you, that the smoker but it's also not good for the people around you. So that's the difference with infectious diseases, and that's no, why I, government I, so, I, has I, to I understand get what you're saying, Michael, but, I mean, the drink-driving analogy, I know I've drunk. If I'm going into a restaurant with COVID-19, I probably don't know I've got it. There's a bit of a difference, isn't there? Yeah, look, I, I agree. If you, 
um, uh, were, um, if you didn't have symptoms, that's the problem with this virus. People are asymptomatic for a period or pre-symptomatic, and that's one of the ways the virus gets around. But what we would say is that's why you wear a mask, because then you hugely decrease the amount of viral particles you're firing into your environment. And obviously, if you're having a meal or drinking, you can't be wearing the mask when you're doing that. But at other times, other social gatherings, if you're wearing a mask and the people around you are wearing masks, you actually decrease the risk from a one-to-one -one interaction of transmitting the virus by over 200-fold. That's how effective these high-quality masks are now. No, and so that's, that you've, we've, you've raised this yeah. issue and talked about it before, just what you're talking about now. Is it something called the 90, is it something, there's a number for it, 95 mask? What's the one, the surgical, the proper one? Yeah. We, we talk about the, the ones that I think everyone's getting pretty familiar with now, the respirator-style masks, which yeah. really cover your nose and mouth very well. Yeah. And the, they, the reason they, they're so good is they've been evolved for hospital healthcare workers for decades. And if you think you're a healthcare worker, you go to work every day, month after month, in a ward treating people with COVID-19 or TB or other respiratory infections, you don't get infected. And the what reason about is those you're blue surgical, What about masks. those blue surgical ones? Because... Those are the ones that have been given to kids at school. And I, I'm so, I really do question the effectiveness and efficacy of them. But those ones you said to me the last time we talked are not going to do the job. It, it depends on the environment. They um, give you um, a, de a reasonable degree of protection. Um, and remember, the, the big value of those masks is if everyone's wearing them, they're actually very good at stopping you firing out all those respiratory, those infected um, aerosols. That's what they're, they're designed to do. Um, but if you're really worried about your health and you, you've got maybe your immune system isn't in great shape, uh, you really need to wear a respirator-style mask because that has a good seal. It means you're, you're less likely to have that infected aerosol coming into your Airways. Can I tell you something so, else, Michael, that yeah. this breaks down on? There's two, there's two issues that I think irritate people. One is the practicality of it. They look at people, for example, that, and then they watch people go to a rugby test and they're not having to wear a mask to go to a rugby test. There's 40,000 people there. Um, yeah, I've got to wear a mask into a supermarket, but I am further away from the rest of my people in the supermarket than I am from at my rugby test when I'm surrounded by people. Um, so it's that sort of practicality yeah. issue that I think it irritates a lot of people. They don't understand why in this situation do I have to, but in this situation I don't. And then that leads to almost distrust, if you like, of, of the official advice because they see the logical inconsistencies, if you like, of where we are at the moment. Do you accept that? Yeah, I do. I mean, uh, one of the challenges is to come up with a set of rules that are very consistent um, and that people regard as acceptable. Uh, and I, I think at a certain point, um, the rules have become less consistent. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, from an um, infection control point of view, we always think about the three Cs, that if you've got them, you're really in trouble from an infection transmission point of view, and that's confined places crowded places and with this close contact. And that's what the virus loves in terms of transmission. And unfortunately, that applies to many of our social, indoor social um, events, that people go there and, of course, they take off their masks for a tea and drink. It's often indoors, particularly in winter. You've got cr people crowded in there. And, of course, you're having great conversation. I mean, we love that. But that, the virus also loves that. That's how it's, it's getting around the world at the moment. Um, so... No, um, I, there, is a, I, I, there is a mismatch between controlling the virus and what people, I think, say is acceptable. And really, outdoor events are pretty good. I think the trouble with the big um, um, the test matches or the big stadium events it may not be so much what's happening in the seated areas, if, particularly if there's a bit of a breeze. It, it'll be much more what people are doing when they're queuing for food, uh, going to the, the bathrooms and transporting themselves there and then um, socialising afterwards. So unfortunately, everything around those events results in a lot of transmission of this virus. Okay, next issue though um, on that is, is the rat test. I was sure I had COVID, Michael. I tested myself, I think three or four rat tests. It showed me negative, but I knew that I wasn't. Uh, sure enough, the fifth or sixth rat test that I did showed me to have COVID. 
How effective are they really as a testing device? Yeah, well, we know that, you know, we've we got quite used to the gold standard of PCR testing, which of course is highly sensitive and very specific. The rat tests are about uh, 80% at best sensitivity, and that's why uh, people are advised to, you know, retest themselves every couple of days if they've got symptoms that, that are suggestive. And you can still go and get a PCR test if you're getting maybe two negative rat tests, but you've got the symptoms. And the other thing, of course, is if you've got a history of exposure to other cases or you've been in, in high-risk indoor environments. So they're the two things you want to use to decide whether you really need to go all out to get um, additional testing. All right. Finally, uh, Michael, you talked about tolerance for harm. Now, we're losing, according to the Department of Health, 30 people a day with COVID. Now, we both know, we talked about it, you and I, the last time we talked about, well, how many people are actually dying of COVID. Now the Ministry of Health is coming up with different sorts of stats on that. You know, when people first, when the first death occurred, you'll remember this one. It was a lady on the west coast. I think she was the first person to die of the west uh, of COVID. Um, we almost got a life story, and why she was a hero of something. And I mean, you know, for every person who died initially, um, there was almost a, a, a national eulogy. Now, thirty people that die a day. What to do? Um, is that is that symptomatic of the fact that we have passed to a position where we don't care? No, I think I hope we still care. Um, but initially, when we were following elimination, every case mattered in New Zealand. And you're right. I mean, the deaths were so rare. Um, perhaps 50 deaths in the first um, year. I mean, that was amongst the lowest mortality rates in the world. And actually, our mortality rate is still low by international standards. But you're right. Now, um, when, the co when the cases are investigated rigorously, it's found that uh, around uh, the current figure is 77% uh, called COVID attributed. And the other 23% are people who tested positive, but COVID hadn't contributed to their death. And they're being systematically removed. So uh, a lot of effort goes into getting the numbers right. Uh, but it means that if you see um, at the peak, I think we're seeing an average of around 38 deaths a day for a week or two. We're fortunately coming down from that. That meant that about 30 of them would eventually are likely to be caused by COVID. And the trouble with that is if we extrapolate this for a whole year, COVID-19 is moving into being well, where it was for a period, our number one cause of death in New Zealand. It was ahead of ischemic heart disease, which causes heart attacks. So we really don't want that. I mean, that's going to push up our mortality rate overall and actually shorten life expectancy in New Zealand. Yeah, I'm, but I'm looking at, for example, my, my Otago Daily Times. I just thought after I asked that question, well, I must look in the today's paper. And in today's paper, uh, what, 30 people died yesterday. Um, do you know it's not in the first eight pages? In fact, I'm still I'm flicking through the paper now. I still can't see how many people died of it yesterday? Doesn't that suggest that we don't, well, that really we don't care anymore? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think um, we're now, we're actually seeing the peak of COVID-19 mortality since the entire pandemic began in the last um, six weeks. Uh, Hospitalisations are not quite at the same peak they were earlier in the year, the first peak, but they're almost there in, Unfortunately, they're, they're now dropping off. But yes, no, we've, we've had our peak of mortality just now and there's much less interest in it. Yeah, well, uh, th so that goes to me where I think New Zealand must be. I mean, if the national media are reflective of the public or the society in which we live in, then we must have got to a stage now where we've just decided, no, we're going to live with it and to hang with the consequences. Is, is that your reading? Uh, this is where opinions will differ. Uh, I mean, I think actually it's unacceptably high and many of those deaths are preventable. So we should work harder on this. Okay. Uh, and I think partly people don't see the connection between their individual behaviour and the people, people dying a few weeks later. But we are all in this together. 
we are sharing the viruses. Every time one of us gets infected, that increases the risk of all these, these three consequences we don't want, which is deaths, hospitalizations, and also long COVID. All right. Michael, thank you for joining us and giving your point of view. I appreciate the time and the effort that you do. Uh, nice to see you again. Uh, look after yourself. Thank you. All right. Um, there you go. Wow. <laughs> hey, how's that for contrasting opinions? What's yours?